in all likelihood, <coughs> Oswald was never supposed to leave the Texas School Book Depository alive. Hmm. Had he not left alive, had he been killed there, with the evidence already planted, he's dead, never can say a word. They kill the little commie rat, open and shut case. Also, if you'd go back and ask the policeman right now, which we have done, they'll tell you real quickly that they were told to shut up. And there's, there is no way that uh, a fair investigation could have been, in fact, conducted by the people that were on the Warren Commission. Yeah. Also, his ties with the mob, as apparently, if you read David Scheim's book, you know, many, if not most, of our top uh, political leaders have mob contacts. It may even be a situation where the mob has such muscle and influence that you can't really be a top leader without the connections with the mob, or at least a laissez-faire relationship with them. In our last previous program on Alternative Views, we described the conspiracy which resulted in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Now we're going to take a close look at the cover-up, see who was involved politically, militarily, and in the police establishment. Right now on Alternative Views. This is the second in our two-part series of our continuing series of studying the Kennedy assassination. Our last program was with John Stockwell, former CIA official, and Gary Shaw, author of Cover Up. Uh, we talked mainly about the nature of the conspiracy to kill John F. Kennedy, this very complex conspiracy that uh, took place. Well, on the program this time, we're going to talk mainly about the cover-up and how that has continued to today, until today. Except on um, for a lot of books, and speaking of books, a lot of books have been written recently. We're going to review uh, some of these books. Who was actually involved in the cover-up and what steps did it take? The cover-up had to be uh, initiated early on. In other words, it had to be pre-planned. For instance, if you're going to plant certain evidence to, uh, to point the finger of guilt to a party or an individual, then that evidence needs to be manufactured ahead of time. And so probably this was done uh, when the site was chosen, the, the alleged patsy was, was chosen, and uh, uh, the modus operandi was, was all chosen and picked out and so forth. And early on they had done that. The cover-up actually went into to, uh, place at the time of the shooting and that uh, we find that uh, there's conflicting uh, testimony concerning the way the alleged sniper's nest appeared uh, at the time it was found and, and, uh, and later on. In fact, we have at least four and probably five official photographs of the sniper's nest, this sixth floor southeast corner of the school book depository, where the boxes are arranged in four different positions. We don't know today which is the right position because early on there was ch the changing of them. Uh, the uh, hulls from the rifle, the, the original um, officers that uh, saw the scene said that they were laid side by side there. 
Later on, we get photographs, and they're scattered like they would be if it was a bolt-action rifle was used. So these things began early on and had to involve not all of the Dallas police, but maybe one member. Uh, you know, or somebody in a position to manipulate this sort of thing. Somebody who had access to the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository was close to Oswald. Uh, and uh, later on, you know, this cover-up, uh, it had to go into to the upper echelons. Some of it, I think, was conspiratorial, pre-planning, and uh, went to the highest echelons of our government and some of it was of expediency. Well, and, it, yeah. Couldn't there be two aspects of the cover-up, or maybe two different cover-ups? One is the pre-planned conspiratorial cover-up. They knew they had to cover up evidence, medical, uh, ballistic, uh, other types of police-type uh, um, evidence. But then when you got to the higher level, of the Warren Commission, the mass media and all that. That was another cover-up that continues to today, and that may be of, 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 a, of a different nature. A totally different so nature. And that's what I mean by that cover-up yeah. by expediency, and, I, and I'll talk about that. Well, but why don't we talk I about bring the, out, yeah, the, first, the okay. first one first, then we'll talk about the One thing in later. particular I think is very important to remember in this, that in all likelihood, and again, this is speculation, but I think it's pretty sound speculation. In all likelihood, <clears throat> Oswald was never supposed to leave the Texas School Book Depository alive. Hmm. Had he not left alive, had he been killed there with the evidence already planted, he's dead, never can say a word. They kill the little commie rat, open and shut case. Isn't this typical uh, of... Uh operations of assassinations sure. where you have have somebody and he's the assassin sure, and then you kill him right quick. it's typical of mafia well, why why did he get out how could he have gotten out then that's an interesting obviously thing. he he didn't yeah. do as they s supposed he would do mm. or uh, you know and uh, when he did and he made contact with his with his principal and uh, so they had to you know they had plan two or had to go into effect. Had Plan One done its job, we'd not we had not had the the extreme cover up that we've had to have because of it. Mm. And uh, that's a big. I think that's a big point. Uh, I had not really explored that before. But if he had been, they burst in on him and someone shoots him, and his body's there with the evidence in the window with a rifle. Uh, with the boxes, with the bullets, uh, then all of the confusion that must have caused them some anxiety wouldn't have been necessary. And the ruby and all the mysterious things that happen that can only be explained in terms of a damage control and a prolonged and increasingly sloppy conspiracy. Hmm. Now, we talked about the cover-up of medical evidence in our previous program. We know from the two programs previous to that, which you did with us, of a lot of cover-up and destruction of evidence by local police and by the FBI. First, let's talk about the local police. What type of cover-up uh, occurred there? Okay, I think uh, some of it, again, you would have to have somebody in a position to uh, be able to buy them, so to speak. Uh, I think there was cooperation, uh, for instance, in, in allowing Ruby to have full run uh, of uh, the police department and be able to get in the position in which to, to shoot Lee Harvey Oswald, to allow the evidence to be manufactured, to be altered, to be destroyed, and all of the things that happened, there had to be some complicity on the, on the part of that. Some of it also, I think, had to be by expediency. And what I mean by that, let's just say you're uh, Nick McDonald, for instance, and uh, you're a policeman that's, uh, you know, several years of service, and uh, suddenly you're cast into the limelight because you're the one that goes into the theater, and, and uh, you slap Oswald up beside the head, and you're the man responsible for capturing the assassin of the President of the United States. Friend, I don't care what you found out after that. You're not going to tell anybody, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you want him to be guilty. You know, this is your moment in history. And I believe a lot of that took place. Also, if you go back and ask the policemen right now, which we have done, they'll tell you real quickly that they were told to shut up. <clears throat> By whom? 
by their uh, superiors. By their superiors. And number two, uh, not only were they they told to shut up, but the case was taken from the hands of the Dallas police authorities and transferred to the FBI, contrary to all laws of the land at that time. And how soon did the FBI come in to take over? Oh, they took over immediately, immediately, by and large, but but soon after. And, of course, one of the things we pointed out in 1976, and we have this from a firm report, that Captain Will Fritz, who was in charge of homicide and robbery and, and in charge of the interrogation of Oswald, is... Uh, in 1975, after uh, the Zapruder film had been shown for the first time on nationwide television, he's eating breakfast with his buddies the next day, and they're talking about it, and uh, he, he just almost stops in mid-bite, and he says, well, probably all of this is going to come out now. He said, but I'll tell you fellas, this is a group that he always ate with, I'll tell you guys, that when the president called me, we were investigating this crime, but when the president called me and told me I had my man, what could I do? By that he means Lyndon Johnson? By that he meant Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson himself called Will Fritz and told him <laughs> Lee Harvey Oswald did it. And, of course, that's what Hoover began to espouse immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> now, the FBI was involved in destruction of evidence and manipulation of evidence, uh, tampering with evidence, and uh, they also had a hold of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald for a while, and they, as I understand it, they didn't even keep transcripts of their interrogation of Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, basically, the... The interrogation of Oswald came under Will Fritz, who was pretty well oh. renowned for his interrogation of, of prisoners. And, uh, but the FBI were sitting in on it, as I understand were other intelligence agents, Secret Service. And uh, Fritz made the statement that he kept no notes. That's real important. He kept no notes of the interrogation. Uh, he didn't say, I didn't take any. <laughs> he said, I kept no notes. Uh, but we've got statements from at least two people, including Oswald himself. When he was asked one time about a certain uh, thing, he says, I've already answered that. It's in your notes. Hmm. Read it for yourself. So we know that we, from him and from a, from a, a postal inspector by the name of, of uh, Harry Holmes, who was also present for what I, I don't know what a postal inspector is doing at an interrogation, but he was. Uh, who also mentioned the notes that were being kept, but uh, they've, they've never turned up. And so we don't know what Oswald was saying during, during the hours of his incarceration and before Jack Ruby shot him. But the Dallas police uh, were uh, not as derelict, I think, in, in the evidentiary s stages as was the the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation because some of what they did, uh, you know, I find hard to believe even now. Gary, one of the big aspects of the cover-up has to do with this grassy knoll theory. The Zapruder film, many eyewitnesses immediately after the shooting said that they saw and heard smoke and bullets coming from the opposite end of Dealey Plaza from where uh, Oswald was supposedly shooting him, and the Zapruder film saw, saw Kennedy's head go in two directions. How did they cover up this grassy knoll theory? Who was responsible for that? Was that police, FBI, or how did this cover up take place? Basically, it had to take place uh, in, in this way. The Warren Commission totally relied on the FBI, uh, some for the, from the uh, CIA and some from the Secret Service and other intelligence uh, agencies and investigative agencies, but basically what the FBI fed them, that's what they use. Uh, so that the FBI, you know, completely, uh, you know, they, they didn't say that there were no witnesses who said the shots, but there were no reliable reports of shots anywhere other than the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Uh, one of the 
one of the funny things about that is is they publish steel frames frame by frame of the Zapruder film in the in the Warren Commission uh, volumes when they get to frame number 312 and 313 which is the time of the president's fatal headshot then he takes and reverses those frames afterward that I say he they are they are reversed <laughs> and they're finally caught. And then they have the tendency, is what, what you do if you're following them, it has a tendency to completely negate the backward head movement of the president upon being shot. That's in the Warren Commission report. That's in the Warren Commission I understand volumes. the... Uh, and he wrote a letter, of yeah. course, when they found it, and uh, said it was just a, a printing error. <laughs> uh, all of those frames, and that's the only two that are out of order. So oh, it's this kind of thing all the way through. I thought the FBI had done that. They doctored it up and... and well, they were responsible they for were it. They were responsible. Uh -huh. But they also swallowed a lot of other evidence, didn't they? Oh, yeah. Okay, and the, the witnesses, they um, carefully doctored their use of witnesses, right. too, didn't they? The, so the, they, the witnesses that they, uh, they pushed toward the Warren Commission were those witnesses that buttressed uh, the buttressed the, uh, mm -hmm. their report. Uh, you know, we we got tunnel vision. I admit that as a as a researcher and one who's found flaws in it. And uh, you know, we tend to tend to go in one direction. Uh, but I'm not as bad. I don't have the tunnel vision that they had, and that they would completely ignore all of the. It's amazing the number of witnesses that said a shot was fired. Over 50. They were in Dealey Plaza in a position to hear and see so that the shot came from the president's right front and that kind of thing you, you can't ignore. Of course, the biggest cover-up uh, right away was the Warren Commission and uh, that famous, that, that wonderful uh, memo from that was sent to, to them. Let's see, now I always get that mixed up. Was it the press secretary sending it to, or somebody sending yeah, it to it the was, press secretary? Can you uh, quote that? I love yeah. that. Yeah, it was the uh, uh, assistant attorney general. Oh, that's right. Uh, Nicholas Katzenbach writing to uh, Mr. Bill Moyers, who was new aide to uh, the new president, Lyndon Johnson. And he wrote that, you know, we must, this is a paraphrase, we must uh, say Oswald was the lone assassin and that uh, we, we must not let the American people think that he's not. Right. In other words, we must have him right now in the press as convicted, tried and convicted, and no conspiracy exists, whether domestic or foreign. And we must, uh, we must uh, get the evidence together in such a way that there will be no, no other question. possibilities mm -hmm. and that this is the only possibility. Uh, well, it's funny. So, so that means the cover-up was immediate right up at the top. Now, why somebody had to make this decision that this had to be covered up immediately? Well, I think, that, level. I think that had to come from the highest level. Uh, when the Warren Commission came together, and this is just a little sideline, when they came together in their first uh, uh, initial meetings, the first thing they got was an outline. And uh, a part of the outline, now this is before they've done any investigation, is Oswald as the assassin. That's one of the major breakdowns in their outline. They've already, before they've investigated and looked at the case, decided that they're going to, and here's all the items, the subheadings underneath their outline as to why Oswald was the assassin. Mm -hmm. Now, that had to come from the FBI because they're doing it. They'd already I issued their interim report and uh, supplementary report to that and said Oswald did it and did it alone. When the, when the committee came together, they, they made note of that. John, what is what are your feelings on this? It's one thing to have an assassination of, of a bunch of people getting together and, and killing the president, but then, immediately at the highest levels of the government and the establishment, the Warren Commission was made up of people from the bedrock of the American political and economic establishment: John J. McCloy, Alan Dulles, etc. And these people immediately say. It's Oswald, and that's it, and then they do all this big cover-up. Uh, what, what are they trying to cover up? Well, there's, there is no way 
that a, a fair investigation could have been in fact conducted by the people that were on the Warren Commission. Yeah. Uh, President Johnson selected that committee obviously with great uh, advice and input. So you start with him. You know, we just said that it started with from the very top. The president's supposed to be at the very top. Uh, what did he have to gain and lose in terms of the Kennedy killing and the cover-up? Now, it is debated about whether or not he might have engineered it, you know, so he could become president and, and whatnot. I, I don't see that, really. No. But although God knows his political career was very, very <laughs> dirty and there are some bodies <laughs> lying around. But uh, also his ties with the mob, as apparently, if you read David Scheim's book, you know, many, if not most, of our top uh, political leaders have mob contacts. It may even be a situation where the mob has such muscle and influence that you can't really be a top leader without the connections with the mob, or at least a laissez-faire relationship with them. But in any case, Johnson, like the others we mentioned before, is faced with being permanently eclipsed by John Kennedy. Johnson wanted to be president. He could never become president as long as Kennedy was around. Uh, Kennedy's dead. He's president. I don't think he necessarily engineered the killing, but he certainly benefited from it very greatly. He could have spent his entire presidency presiding over an investigation of the conspiracy to kill Kennedy, or he could get the thing behind him as quickly as possible and go on with his life and his presidency and his place in history. Now, as he did it, his place in history had to do with the great social revolution in the United States that he engineered and the Vietnam War, which is tragedy that he engineered. Uh, and it had very little to do with, uh, with the Kennedy killing, a cursory uh, sweep it under the, under the rug. Uh, so he leaped immediately. He was obviously predisposed to leap upon the lone assassin, get the thing behind him, and go on with his life. You go to others, Alan Dulles. To put him on that committee, he was obviously a mortal enemy of John Kennedy. He was the person in the CIA, the famous director who really was responsible for the Bay of Pigs fiasco. Even to the detail of arranging to be in Puerto Rico giving a lecture when the landing happened so that he would have plausible deniability, which meant he wasn't there to persuade the president to do this or that. He was hiding out down in Puerto Rico. And he got fired. You know, his place in history, to mind you, he had been involved in great manipulations uh, during and after World War II. He had a great sense of his own uh, role in history, behind the scenes perhaps, but nevertheless making and breaking presidents all over the world. And he's uh, fired by Kennedy in some humiliation at the end of his long and distinguished career. To put him on that commission, what chance are you going to have of him vigilantly investigating who killed the president, especially if some of his own former CIA people were involved, as they clearly were. Uh, Gerald Ford, others on the committee, were pro st strong historic uh, allies and protectors of the FBI. And as we said before, J. Edgar Hoover had a long lifetime association with organized crime. And uh, the FBI director who gave the orders to, to focus on the lone assassin. In some ways, if the cover-up seems so crass and flagrant, uh, and yet, if you understand the workings of the government, they, they generally come up with party lines. Uh, I mean, the president or Henry Kissinger, when he dominated the government, would put out the word, and this is the policy, and everybody else, even if they knew it wasn't true, that was the line, and everybody sort of takes up on it. The admirals, the generals, that passed the word down in the Bethesda Medical Center and, and Walter Reed Hospital uh, that, you know, that people better not speak, they wouldn't have to be calling on the phone to the admiral, for example, saying, be sure that the autopsy is done this way and this way and this way to make the cover-up work. They wouldn't present it that way at all. They would be saying, look, we want to make sure that this lone assassin, they've already caught the killer. We want to make sure there are not a lot of wild rumors and people agitating around the nation. And Johnson gave them some useful cover stories. He said, if I investigate this thing r vigilantly, we may have to go to war with Russia implying that the Russians might have done it. So the general is calling down to, to the admiral, to the people down below, saying, let's keep this thing under control. Let's be mature about it. They've already caught the killer. It's obviously this commie nut, Lee Harvey Oswald. Now make sure everybody doesn't go hog wild and keep the lid on those doctors down there. I, want, I don't want them shooting off their mouths. And in a military establishment, <clears throat> with the discipline they have, that would be sufficient for a whole lot of people to say, aye, aye, sir. Here's the word, yes, sir. 
And, let's, and then, of course, they had to have someone a little more cynical than that to manipulate the photographs, to, you know, to put hair in places where there wasn't hair before and cover up wounds that... Uh, so they, I mean, they literally cut, it's in the high treason book, of the, the head of the president. You can see where they added in, in effect, a toupee to cover up where, the, the, where wounds actually existed. Uh, this kind of thing, the whole government agreeing, and then the establishment agreeing, the press agreeing. Okay, here's the line, this is the way it is, the president said. Uh, the Warren Commission said, and it all falls kind of naturally into place. Except, in this case, I mean, they've done it hundreds and hundreds of times with lesser things, the necessity of our going into the Vietnam War. That blew up in their faces later on, but it worked for a while, and the nation marched off to war again. Uh, they did it very successfully with Ronald Reagan as he was president, trying to make him appear as a wise, uh, benign president, when in fact he was mentally defective. He couldn't think straight. But they all agreed that he was the president, and it was his policies, and they packaged him and sold him to the country. Well, now there was a massive mass media cover-up in this, too. Uh, they went right along with it. To this day, the establishment media say you were given the party line of the Warren Commission. Now, how could they have been uh, controlled and fit into this framework? Well, 80 percent of our news in this country is quoting the president or quoting some figure, quoting the Warren Commission. This is how they maintain power in the hands of the people in power, or are the voices, the spokespeople in, in power. The news is that in giving his speech today, President Bush said such and so. It's not considered to be good form to write, and he was lying through his teeth throughout the whole thing, and everybody was laughing and giggling because it couldn't possibly be true. No, the news story is the president said such and so, and then what he said. And then Senator so and so, and the Warren Commission, there was article after article, when the people on the commission itself were speaking out, and they were all saying, and J. Edgar Hoover's statements, and Bill Moyer's statements, and the Assistant Attorney General's statements, and all the others saying it's clearly a lone assassin. So the media is reporting that. Now, obviously, the media, one would dream that the media could take a more aggressive position and put big headlines saying flagrant cover-up of foot, people are lying all over the place, but the rules of journalism that the owners of the media have established are that that would be irresponsible journalism. This is where you get into the books, you know, manufacturing consent. Chomsky's book on the subject, or Inventing Reality, uh, uh, Michael Parenti's book on the subject, how they make believe, and they make the nation believe they're make believe. It's irresponsible journalism for the newspapers to take the lead and say what happened. They believe their role, or they maintain that their role, is to announce or to repeat to the public what the leaders say happened. On the editorial page, they obviously could do a better job. They would defend themselves, I'm quite <coughs> sure, by saying, oh, we ran lots of articles about other theories and other possibilities, and we ran lots of op-ed pieces expressing doubt about this, that, and the other, and they go back and show you the articles. But it still doesn't carry weight until you get some front-page story saying Senator so-and-so says this is a flagrant cover-up, Kennedy was killed, sloppy investigation, massive cover-up of foot, and, and the media didn't see its responsibility to do that. It saw its responsibility to participate in the cover story. There's another aspect of this, too, um, is that from my studies, if you look to see who the media moguls were at this time and who the top people in the American power structure, you know, like the head of Chase Manhattan Bank, the head of Ford Foundation, the head of the CIA, you find that they are all interlocked with each other. They are involved in organizations such as the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers. They are in a lot of the same elite social clubs. The head of the Time Life was a man who was a very important person at the top of the American power structures, uh, C.D. Jackson. So it would be very easy for these people to see each other informally or call each other up knowing each other and their attitudes on keeping control of the uh, government and the economic system, it would be very easy for them to coordinate, say, hey, that we got to do this, and then they would just take it from there. Wayne Smith, you know, who's, who's a, a distinguished professor at Johns Hopkins, was formerly the State Department's representative in Cuba and resigned in 82 in protest of Reagan's policies. A lifetime career as a diplomat vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. and Cuba. 
and uh, not long ago during the summer when I was reading some of these books he w we were talking on the phone he said that their feeling back then at the time of the killing was that the nation was simply not ready for the awful truth that the fabric of society couldn't uh, tolerate it couldn't accept it and and then he said he wasn't sure they were necessarily wrong given the circumstances back then although his position is that now enough time has gone by that w we should investigate he would like to see a full honest investigation at the pro present time my answer to him maybe i'm a purist maybe i'm still in a perverse way naive as i was naive when the cia was using me but i don't buy that even if it would tear the nation apart from top to bottom if that's what's if you have such cynicism that they can kill the president and stuff it down the public's throat to cover up and go on about their lives then we need to tear the society apart from top to bottom and shake it apart and get some sense of law and order what reality of order can there be in a society that is that cynical? You know what? Uh, oh, excuse me. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Well, I, he, he, you know, I, I said that, and he, he, he did not disagree with me. <laughs> He's certainly working now to get an investigation. But if someone like him would, would clearly understand their thinking back then, well, it's, it's truly gruesome, but the nation just wouldn't be ready to deal with a cover-up that kills our president better to pull together and keep you know nationalism going and everything wow i think every time i see the big dogs say something like that i saw it during watergate etc no oh, it'll tear this country apart if we have an investigation on what they're really saying is that the american people would find out too much about how the american political and economic system really work and who controls it and how and who benefits and if this window were to open up and people were to see the way things really would happen, they would be quite angry. So in the Kennedy case, they would see how the CIA was operating, as Lyndon Johnson later said, a damn um, murder incorporated in, the, in Latin America. They would see the relationships between the establishment people and the mob and organized crime and drugs. And they would see uh, these, all of these unsavory things which the American people are not aware of. And if there were a true investigation of this, these things would come out, and they if might there, lose control. If there had been a true investigation of the Kennedy uh, killing, George Bush's policies today would be different, if he would be in office, in fact. Uh, his his double-sided cover story about a war on drugs, while his own personal and his own staff's involvement with major drug dealers uh, he, of course, blithely ignores, and the major media blithely ignores, even though they have previously published these things. They've now agreed it's okay. What, what's happening there, one can surmise, is a carryover to the Kennedy assassination. Is This is the mafia, after all, or forms of it, that are smuggling the drugs, and you really are never going to go after them. You, know, you don't want to get yourself bumped off. It's much better to play ball and all the balances take place and that way you don't get yourself assassinated. In fact, there's even a more sinister aspect to this cover-up than we've gone into so far, and that is the amount of people that were killed or mysteriously died who were either involved in the conspiracy or had evidence and testimony that went against the lone assassin theory. Gary, when did the mysterious deaths, so to speak, begin with the cover-up? When did witnesses begin dying, let us say, under mysterious circumstances, and how broad did this mysterious death Well, I think it probably had to go. start with Lee Oswald mm -hmm. in the basement <laughs> of the Dallas Police Department, I guess, right. and uh, it goes from there. Mm -hmm. It started immediately, and uh, it continues even today. Uh, there's no way to put a number figure to it, but uh, you can, let's just take two or three, George DeMore and Shield, who was Oswald's best friend in Dallas, a very uh, influential uh, Russian emigre and, and a very smart, intelligent uh, man, befriended the Oswalds. He had uh, French intelligence connections dating back into World War II. Did some very strange t things, had some strange connections to some very uh, high-ranking people. In fact, was in the uh, intelligence uh, agency headquarters in mid-1963 with a colonel and uh, a man from uh, down in Haiti, one of the very important bankers down there. But that's a story, uh, you know, a different story. Three hours before he was to uh, talk to a 
Senate investigator looking into the Kennedy assassination. Uh, he'd already made contact with him, set up the appointment. He takes a shotgun, puts it in his mouth, and blows his brains out. Uh, that's what we're told, and I'm uh, supposing that that's what happened. But uh, the key is it was because of the Kennedy assassination. Sam Giancana was one of these with uh, Operation Mongoose, one of the organized crime figures who had already w was telling the Senate and was being called before them one more time. And uh, late in the night, uh, he is shot in, his, in the basement of his home as he's fixing a breakfast, obviously for himself and whoever this friend, quote unquote, <laughs> is that's there with him, who shoots him once in the back and then I understand shoots him seven times in the mouth as he lays there dying, uh, meaning just to quiet. make his point. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. uh, Giancana's associate in this operation, Mongoose, which was the Castro assassination attempts, mm -hmm. was a fellow by the name of John Roselli. You people have heard this story, but but it's very important. Uh, he's been talking about all of the things surrounding the Castro. Uh, attempts and the John Kennedy assassination and suddenly he ends up uh, floating up out of uh, Key Biscayne, Florida and a 55 gallon drum he's been cut to pieces and stuffed into it and left there for dead. Uh, this goes on and on and on. There are eyewitnesses in yeah. Dealey Plaza to uh, Ruby Associates and uh, friends to organized crime figures to high CIA people. How and, many? How oh, many? I have no idea. It's, uh, you know, it's been calculated uh, by some to be in the 40s and 50s and by some on up in uh, past 100. Yeah, I don't think yeah. you can actually say. The High Treason book is one of the better recent books. Mm -hmm. Let's but talk about some of these recent books. Yeah, so. this, would, this would definitely be useful. This book, High Treason, by Robert Groden and Harrison Livingston, they list 49 people, as I count them. They don't have a number, but I went down and numbered. If I didn't miss one, it was 49 by name, explaining what their association with uh, the killing, what, what they knew and the timing of their killing. And then they mention a couple places of seven here and seven there that also were killed without naming them. These 49 killings, as they describe them, they're imaginative, uh, all kinds of deaths, some of them apparently suicides, some of them improbable suicides, car crashes, shootings, bludgeonings, uh, you name it. Uh, they could be done by anyone. I see a lot of mob involvement, mm -hmm. but this is frankly because I know so much about the, the Jack Ruby's involvement in the killing and other mob figures in and around the killing. And so you know the mob was there, and then you think of these things, yeah, that sounds like the mob might very well have done that. If it had been a killing uh, in a situation where there was no possible mob involvement, I would not have felt uncomfortable in believing that these were engineered by people like the CIA's OP Mongoose people mm. or people working out of the Pentagon. Uh, there's nothing special about them. It's just different ways you can knock people off trying to keep it well, I say trying to keep it from being too flagrant, but lots of them are very <laughs> flagrant. Getting on to these books, yeah, the uh, we've got so many and such good ones coming out now, and it makes it, in 1980, reading Anthony Summers' book, uh, clearly you could only conclude from that that there was a conspiracy. What was the name of that book? Uh, uh, conspiracy. conspiracy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> His book, good Conspiracy. Name. And he's... Uh, he, he, but he pulls his punches, sort of, or he pulls up at the end. He won't deal with the killed witnesses, and, and he won't deal really with projecting as to who might have done the conspiracy, who was responsible for it and under what circumstances. Now, there were some books out then. Uh, Gary's book, a cover-up, did deal with, you know, who might have done it with the conspiracy, and uh, the conspiracy and the killing and the cover-up. Uh, we we had a kind of a dearth for a while. Books coming out. There have been lots of books on the assassination, I'm sure. Oh, but yeah. major books coming out. Recently, we've had several come out that, that, that really bring a lot of this together in great detail. And just to mention these for the benefit of the, the viewers, uh, there's the book Best Evidence by David Lifton. And this one doesn't reach any conclusions, but it just goes meticulously over the evidence showing... Uh, all the discrepancies in the Warren Commission's uh, presentation of things. Very powerful without leading you anywhere uh, in, uh, 
in the in the picture. This book, Reasonable Doubt by E. Hurt, you can show it to the camera. Uh, the first half of this book I found to be just absolutely excellent, as he presents the the evidence in in Dallas around the killing that could not fit a lone assassin theory. The second half of the book I felt like it drifts into things that are much less specific a little harder to follow, uh, and thereby less uh, convincing. Just in the last year, we have two books that have come out that are really quite fascinating, a little bit of unfortunate controversy around them, but th they even that may stimulate interest and make it worthwhile. But you have David Scheim's book, which presents a strong case. This is Contract on America, and it sold zillions of copies, fortunately. Zebra Press, published last year. Uh, where he focuses on the extent of the mob's involvement in the killing, but also with top U.S. political leaders. Uh, this is an excellent book to get a vision of how much an influence and how vigorous and how energetic the mob is and was in that killing. Unfortunately, it's a weakness in his book, I think. He just doesn't deal with the CIA's presence very much in the killing. Now, we've corresponded with him since then, and it is not that he believes the CIA was not present. He does. But he was just investigating the mob's, you know, involvement in it. And well, perhaps a better choice of wording, he might have said that. He might have come out and said, you know, the CIA was also involved, but I focused on the mob. And the mob overlaps into the CIA. This then, is then you have the Garrison book, which goes the opposite and says it was the CIA and doesn't say much about the mob. And so Garrison's what? book is another excellent book. That's Jim Garrison uh, from New Orleans. He was the district attorney who investigated this thing, who, who engineered some, some uh, uh, the trial, tried to get people prosecuted, tried to prosecute Clay Shaw, uh, himself was put on trial, uh, and both of those trials were, were futile. The people were not convicted, he or Shaw. And then evidence came out much later that he probably would have won his case if he had had the full evidence against Shaw that came out years after Shaw died, one of the 49 people. Uh, unfortunately, the controversy that surrounds Garrison is he was uh, flailed by the major media. And lots of stories were circulated that he was associated with the mob. He was a district attorney in New Orleans where the mob ran things and had all that Marcello had so much energy and control. And he's, of course, said that they were just out to get him because he was exposing their activities. Unfortunately, for his case, for his credibility, he has a shot in this book to clarify his position vis-a-vis -vis the mob. And he doesn't. Even in this book, when he had a chance to say, here's why I was not involved with the mob, uh, he, instead, he says that Jack Ruby may have run some errands for the mob. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. And he says uh, at the end, he pass, brushes off mob involvement. At other times, he said that in New Orleans, he's found no evidence of Carlos Marcello running things or dominating things. And you could not be district attorney in New Orleans and not know of the extent of Marcello's activities. Maybe he doesn't so, want to be assassinated. Well, it could very well be. <laughs> and now... now uh, Scheim, it gets a little stickier than that. Scheim writes in his book that Garrison has mob ties and has been seen having brother with Carlos Marcello's brothers. Having, having dinner, having oh. breakfast and dinner, sorry, <laughs> uh, with Car Carlos Marcello's brothers uh, after Marcello was in prison. And uh, this would, you know, imply an intimate, and also citing a time he went up country with them to some villa in Louisiana uh, to meet with them. Now, we've tracked this down and asked Scheim about his source on that, and he says his sources are impeccable, but they're anonymous. He can't reveal them for the evidence of, of Garrison dining with uh, the Marcello brothers. That's unfortunate, because to make an assertion like that, it would be awfully nice if you had some documentation you could share with readers to help them judge, a photograph or something to help them judge, and he doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. So he's asking us to take it on faith that uh, he has uh, unimpeachable sources of that information. Uh, it, he, he nevertheless, I think these are two excellent books, but they're just looking at different parts of the elephant. One of them, showing the mob involvement, is, is just an excellent piece of work. And Garrison's book is fascinating, and his conclusions are very strong, although he just will not address the mob issue. This is what brings us to the, the, the best book that we have out recently, is High Treason by Robert Groden and Harrison Livingston, Conservatory Press, published in 1989. Uh, they put it all together.
Mm. Now, they, they really try to beat it to death. They overwrite it. They make a point and then they repeat it five times to make it very clear what they're trying to say. And given all the obfuscation and confusion around the assassination, I find this effective in dealing with this subject. It's a, it's a well-written book to this purpose. And they put it all together. They show the mob's involvement, the CIA's involvement, the military's involvement. They show the photographs that were altered. They discuss how the body was, was altered and, and changed from one casket to the next. All kinds of details in it. And they do reach conclusions, which again, Anthony Summers avoided doing. They project, as we've done in this show and the previous one, as to how it must have been done and who must have been involved. And they conclude, as we have, that, that the CIA uh, engineered the killing itself, the ambush, and the cover-up was the, the result of a broad uh, conspiracy, if you will, cooperation between the FBI and the military and the CIA and the Warren Commission uh, and the White House. They tend to, if you'll permit me, they tend to gild the Kennedys in a way that I would not do. They, they really idolize them and uh, attribute to them no evil and no remarkable weaknesses. And what, what role do they attribute to the mob in there? You didn't mention that analysis in the High Treason book. It deals with the CIA's involvement and with the mob's involvement and shows the relationship between the two. And do they get that right? Because no one previously had explored the way that... Do they also go into the Operation Mongoose story? Yeah, they go into it, although, yeah, they go into it convincingly. Mm -hmm. They could go into greater detail, they could explore it further, but they go into it, and uh, it's, it's a very convincing book. And I, very, mm -hmm. what, what, what do you think of there's it? A, there's another book that ought to be mentioned, okay. uh, and that's John Davis's book uh, called Mafia Kingfish, right. uh, and it concerns Carlos Marcello, the New Orleans right. Mafia chieftain, and, and uh, takes uh, the same position as Shime to some extent, but uh, more more detail, more evidence, and very convincing in that area. High treason, Robert Groden, it ought to be made known, uh, he is the same Robert Groden that uh, did all of the fine work on the Abraham Zapruder film, the original optically enhanced, and, mm. and had the intestinal fortitude to uh, to get on the Geraldo Rivera show and show it on national television under threat of lawsuit mm -hmm. and everything else you can think of and uh, showed it to the American people and was a, a great boost to uh, you know the American public's awareness of what was going on here. To what extent does it correspond with your own research? Do I you would have point a slightly out different take on this? No, I would yeah. point out that that he, he brings out some new evidence mm -hmm. uh, in it. He, uh, he's one of the first to publish, by the way, the new best evidence book, as well as his, publishes for the first time the uh, black and white photographs of the president's autopsy. Now, a lot of people are going to cry, oh, that's just terrible to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, the only reason it's done, the only reason it's done is because what the evidence shows from those autopsy photographs makes a liar out of the previous investigations one more time. You should show the viewers the J. Edgar Hoover book, Secrecy and Power. Oh. It's a book that's excellent. It's, it's restrained. It, they pull their punches. They don't talk about the fact that J. Edgar Hoover stole a million dollars from the American taxpayer. He was a thief. But they do make it clear, and you read that in conjunction with the contract on America, and you get the extent to which the Mafia is involved with our leaders. J. Edgar Hoover, a lifetime involvement with organized crime while deny, denying that it existed in the United States. Uh, and Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon's involvement with organized crime. And even uh, the Kennedys sort of alter ego involvement with them, although they were, they were after them, they also had uh, involvements with them. Uh, sharing mistresses. Sharing it? mistresses, uh, for example. Gary, we've seen on TV um, Uncle Walter Cronkite on PBS coming out with a program that was absolute whitewash of the Warren Commission, and they didn't look at anything else. They just tried to make it appear credible. And then the Jack Anderson had a rather strange thing 
where he said it was Castro who did it, and the reason they did the cover-up was because if the, if the American people knew that it was Castro, that they would have been uh, aroused and up in arms, and they would have won the United States to invade and destroy Cuba, and then that would have brought to Russia into the war, and then we'd had World War III. Did you see these two? This, uh, yes, and of course that's not new. That's to us. It's been uh, one of the one of the things that's been put forth for uh, for a number of years. I reject it just for the simple fact that uh, number one, I don't think we were anywhere near that, uh, and uh, there there could never have been a time that I think that Castro would have felt comfortable in killing the president of the United States. And uh, so I reject that, and, and I certainly don't think that there was enough to that for, the, for him to have the power or his causing that to be done, and there, he have the power to cover up or cause to have the cover up perpetrated for all of these years. Gary, getting back to this high treason, do they speculate there on who the actual hit team was to the extent that uh, you do, where you point to some of the people that could have been actually involved? in the assassination, do they go that far? No, they do not. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and when we point to some of the people, it, uh, we point to them because we have evidence that causes us to point right. to those. Uh, for instance, on our last show that we did together, we, uh, we looked at uh, a man by the name of Charles Harrelson, right. who's a well-known assassin, hit man, and who had uh, already confessed to, to uh, not only killing a federal judge in San Antonio, Texas, but also he said at the same time, I also killed President Kennedy. Uh, others have confirmed the fact that he was not lying and that he has been for a number of years, even as a young man, he was about 25 in 1963, even as a young man, one of the top qualified assassins in the United States. So I don't find it unusual. And uh, if a guy says he does, uh, you know, does something, I think it ought to be looked at. The media <laughs> yeah. said, uh, so what? Ho hum. And there's uh, evidence that he was in Dallas. Well, there is some evidence in that we have photographs of, of some of people traps. being arrested, and one of them is the uh, uh, spitting image of the man. In fact, we've, we've shown photographs of, of him and of the, the man being arrested and uh, to uh, two independent forensic anthropologists, people who testify, doctors who testify uh, in court on, on matters of facial resemblance. And they said that there was a 90 to 95% probability that the two men are one and the same. So you have one of the most detailed accounts of the Kennedy assassination, yet did any of the media call on you during the, night, the 25 anniversary celebrations last uh, fall? I didn't see you on the... Con constantly, yeah. but I, I got cut. <laughs> yeah. So you were actually I, I, interviewed. I got the cutting room floor most of the uh -huh. time. In the uh, about three and a half minutes we have left, it's not much to make time to make a conclusion, but uh, the uh, satirist Paul Krasner said, uh, we saw him say that, well, we've had all these political assassinations, and the survivors now say they have a mandate. <laughs> but... Kennedy, of course, wasn't the last political assassination. You had Karen Silkwood, you had uh, uh, RFK, Bobby Kennedy, you had uh, attempt to kill George Wallace, and Martin Luther King was assassinated. So it appears that uh, political assassination has been alive and well in the United States, and apparently the people saw that they could get away with this, another, either that, this group, that did this conspiracy, or other people say, hey, it works, and we can get away with it. Why not do it? Gary, okay. do you see this Kennedy assassination as a coup d'etat, as one of the books on the subject indicates? It was an attempt by a small group of people literally to seize power because they weren't in agreement with the direction that Kennedy was moving. I definitely do, and I think you can look at history and it'll bear that out. Uh, the, the policies that uh, President Kennedy was moving toward and putting into operation uh, started uh, changing that almost that very day, and uh, we were never the same. And going back to that day, it will be like turning a page in history.
the historian. I think they're already seeing that. You know, one of these days I hope we'll learn the history lesson that this is saying to us. They did do it in 1963. They did cover it up. And when I say they, I wish I knew all of the particulars involved. We don't yet. And, uh, but they have continued to sell it to us until the people today say, what's the use? What can we do about it? We're just one, or we're just 10, or we're just 25. Uh, I would urge you to say, you know, we're still a very viable force in this country when we rise, rise up and, and speak and I say we want something done. We're not through with this. And uh, one of these days history will confirm that uh, President John F. Kennedy was killed by a conspiracy uh, founded within his own government, uh, but the perpetrators after a long period of time were finally convicted and brought to justice. What in a couple of minutes or so uh would you evaluate this whole situation of political assassination? Just to simplify the whole thing, in all of my readings about the CIA secret wars and activities, certainly the, the thing that gives you the, the bottom line of the cynicism is the Kennedy killing. That they would engineer a killing because they're not content with the electoral process and assassinate our president and stuff it down the public's throat, the cover story, and get by with it so that no one is prosecuted. The cynicism of doing this in broad daylight in front of the eyes of the world, if you will, pretty much says it all, doesn't it? Yeah. That brings us to the end of this Alternative Views. Gary Shaw has established the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas. It's a repository of a lot of information concerning the assassinations available to the public. It has films, newsreels, audio and visual tapes, artifacts, government documents, books, and publications. They're available to you in the center's files. It's a 3,000 square foot area which includes a public exhibit where evidence and information concerning the assassinations are on display. You can also see a 20-minute film of the assassination and its controversies. If you'd like a copy of this brochure, which you've been looking at on your screen, send a self-addressed stamped envelope to JFK Assassination Information Center, West End Marketplace, Suite 310, 603 Munger Avenue, Dallas, Texas, 75202. The phone number is 214-871-2770. That's the JFK Assassination Information Center, West End Marketplace, Suite 310, 603 Munger Avenue, Dallas, Texas, 75202. We frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications, which we use on Alternative Views, and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope because we just can't afford the postage. We don't only get about three to $5,000 a year to run this program. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Bye. Always innovative, Essex Community College is planning a silent verbal auction.